Welcome to another edition of Against the Current, coming to you from the Skyline Club atop the Old Republic Building in downtown Chicago. Pleased to have as my guest for this installment, Zach Model, who is the Chief Alignment Officer for a fourth generation manufacturing company in Illinois, Atlas Toolworks, located in scenic West Suburban Lions. Zach, thanks so much for joining us. Great to be here today. This is going to be a painful conversation to have around the holidays about manufacturing in Illinois, so why don't we get right to it? Why is it, in your estimation, as an operator of a manufacturing company, fourth generation, as I mentioned, why is it that uh, Illinois hasn't seen the recovery of manufacturing jobs since the Great Recession that all of our Midwestern neighbors have? Well, I think you know as well as I do the answer to that question. Illinois has not set a very appealing place, uh, set an appealing table for manufacturers. You know, when you want a business to come and locate in your state, in your region, in your country, you need to create an environment that allows them to grow and be profitable and do what they do. And Illinois has uh, spent at least the last few years, if not the last decade or two, creating an environment where manufacturers see that their costs will rise, that they can't control those costs, and that they will uh, have a hard time making a profit and, and they will be subject to additional litigation. So until we change some of the things in Illinois, we're gonna have a hard time attracting manufacturing businesses. So let's talk specifically about some of those drivers of cost in Illinois that are uh, you know, government related uh, in terms of comparing and contrasting operating a manufacturing business in Illinois versus Indiana or Wisconsin or Iowa, or Missouri, Kentucky, basically anywhere else in the Western world other than Illinois. Um, what's at the top of your list? We could talk workers' comp, we could talk property taxes, we could talk uh, the range of issues, just general structural taxation. You know, what's at the top of your list? Let's start with workers' comp, because that's pretty much at the top of my list. And, and, you know, and, this, and this, you know, this is some talk in layman's terms on this, because this is a term that's bandied about. We need workers' comp reform, workers' comp costs are two and a half times what they are in Indiana, and so on and so forth. And uh, you have, it seems to me, the debate in Springfield is rather dismal. On the one hand, you have reformers talking about the need for workers' comp reform to reduce costs. And on the other side, those who want to protect the system as is just say worker safety, worker safety, worker safety. Who's mm -hmm. against worker safety? So if you can, distill the issue for us so it's not this false choice between reducing costs and protecting workers. You're, you're exactly right. You know, that argument gets framed so poorly in Springfield. And I've had the opportunity to talk to a lot of, you know, legislators and had them out for tours. And, you know, they're always there for the photo op. And they always say they're for manufacturing and they want it on their mailer. But when it comes down to voting, they don't always get it. And I don't think they take the time to listen through the noise of what you just talked about, particularly on workers' comp. You know, uh, the other side likes to say, if we do workers' comp reform, you're, you're going to have more injuries and injured workers aren't going to get taken care of and, and all sorts of nightmare horror stories. But that's absolutely not true. Any employer wants their employees, any employer that's trying to run a business, needs those employees to be there and, and make the parts and the product in manufacturing. So if I have injured workers out and not getting the care they need, I don't have my team there to help me make the product that I need to ship. So, you and, know, and, and like any business, you're, you've invested heavily in your workers. You want, you know. Training, a skilled workforce is really hard in manufacturing right now. I could double the size of my business, but for finding the right trained workers to run the machines. I can buy the machines, I can take the orders, but I can't get the right people to run them and do it efficiently and make a profit. So I, I really care about my workforce. And I think that most manufacturers in Illinois are the same way, whether they're a small family business like mine or a big company like Caterpillar. We care about our workforce and we need a good trained workforce. They're working, not injured. But when you come to workers' comp, so the other side likes to say that the workers will not get taken care of. That's absolutely not true. You look at Indiana, we don't hear stories about people bleeding out and dying in the streets because they're not being having their workforce injuries taken care of. You know, uh, we, we have in Illinois this thing of causation, right? And in our workers' comp system in Illinois, if the workplace is 1% responsible for the injury, it's a workers' comp claim. And that's really the root of the problem. It's not about taking care of injured workers. It's about uh, the people who make money off this system and making sure that they drive injuries into the workers' comp system. You mean the attorneys? Attorneys, doctors, you know, there's a whole network of providers that make money off this system and they get paid more. The doctors get a little higher reimbursement for workers' comp claims. So they have, you know, I don't know if you, you've ever been hurt, but you know, I go to the doctor. I, I had a back injury a few months ago. It was something personal happened at home. I can't tell you how many times that doctor asked me if it was work-related or anything at my work had aggravated it or done anything to it. 
And I'm not saying the doctor was wrong. That's just what they're trained to do in Illinois. They, and they have an incentive because once you have a workers' comp claim, they can charge more and there's fees and there's tests and it's a whole different system. And then same, uh, you know, and same for the insurance company. So that same injury, I get a mailer from Blue Cross Blue Shield asking me if this was at all related to something that happened at work and they want me to answer yes or no. So there's a whole system here in Illinois of trying to push people out of what should be a healthcare claim where you have a deductible, you don't get paid time off and you get your injury taken care of into another system which pretty much is the same outcome, although it takes longer to get there. So injured workers in Illinois, if you, if, if you submit a health claim, you're going to pay your deductible, you're going to get fixed, you're going to get back to work. If you go in the workers' comp system, it's going to take you longer to get better. There's going to be more tests. You're going to get poked and prodded and examined and run to more physical therapy. The whole system takes longer to generate the same outcome that would have come out of healthcare. But back to Springfield and, and, and what people don't understand. So this 1% responsibility, other states don't have that. There has to be a higher level of causation. Like, So we had this just last week. We had a worker, uh, she, she pinched her finger on, on two sheets of metal and she got a blood blister, right? Not a big deal, she wasn't even gonna report it, but she popped the blood blister and then she fainted. She hit her head on the floor and she went to the doctor and she's getting physical therapy and all this and that and this whole system that I talked about is taking over. Now, was my company really at fault for her fainting? I mean, you know, uh, she, she fainted at the sight of her own blood. So then the insurance company is starting to be, get a little concerned, the workers' comp insurance company, and they sent someone out to interview her and they talked to her. And she said, well, you know, sometimes I do faint in the morning if I don't have breakfast and I can't remember if I had or hadn't had breakfast that day. And, you know, I have had a history of fainting before. And in fact, I have some vision problems from this when I was out in California at my last job. So all this comes up and, and now she's luckily getting routed back into the healthcare system to get the treatment that she needs, which she should have. Absolutely. I'm not against her getting good care, but I am against if it goes in the workers' comp system, my rates go up, my company pays more. Could you argue that the workplace is 1% responsible? Absolutely. Pretty much every healthcare claim or injury, if you have a job, you could blame it on your work and it would become a workers' comp claim. Illinois has no limit to the liability in the workers' comp system. And that's what we talk about when we ask for reform. It's not about not making sure this woman gets the care she needs. It's about putting her into the appropriate system in the appropriate bucket. So it's costed appropriately and the responsibility is appropriate. So other examples would be like, you know, the weekend warrior, war, the weekend warrior who turns his ankle playing basketball, uh, you know, at the local rec center and then uh, makes a work, makes a, a workers comp claim because, it, well, I also kind of, uh, you know, stepped wrong at work one time and I had a little bit of a twinge and so now I've got it's a combination of my ankle had a little bit of a twinge because of uh, the work I do and then you know then I twisted it, it and some ligaments it in, in, bas in bas playing basketball or yeah. something like that. The, the root cause was the basketball injury but right. because workplace is one percent responsible meaning he walks at work it could be considered a workers' comp claim. And think about these age-related things. You know, a lot of people are working longer and stuff, and we have shoulder issues and elbow issues. You know, I'm a relatively young guy, but things are starting, and I can only imagine it doesn't get better as you get older. All those things could become workers' comp claims. There is infinite liability if you really take this thing out to the end. If, if, if the employee wants to say that, yeah, I've gotten older and my shoulder hurts, but when I come to work, I type or I lift things or I move things, that aggravates it. Boom, it's a workers' comp claim. And they, they have an incentive. They get paid time off, they get a cash payout, those doctors get higher rates, and then you get a lawyer involved, and they tell them, I'm gonna get you some money for that, and blah, blah, blah. I don't blame the worker, I blame the system. And it's those folks in Springfield who have not taken the time to really understand how this works. They just listen to these sound bites, and they say, oh, we're, we can't have injured workers, we can't fix the workers' comp system. No, if you fix the workers' comp system, the only people who are going to be injured are those lawyers who are making a lot of money off of it, and, and they're not really going to be injured. Trust me, they'll find something better to and do And so, so, the, so the simple fix or the reform that you would propose that you think would, would this bring the workers' comp system in Illinois into alignment with uh, our neighboring states if you just address this causation issue? I think that's the number one thing. There's been a lot of proposals from folks who know a lot more than me about, about medical fee schedules and other things, but I think in Illinois the number one is the causation. You have to limit the qualified injuries that go into this pool, and it has to truly be qualified because the workplace was responsible. So I've had workers' comp claims that, like the one I told you about, like other ones, and we are trying. We have a safe workplace, Dan. We try really hard with this. We work with our insurance company. We have a safety officer. We spend a lot of time and money to have a safe workplace, and I don't think we've had any serious injury. 
but we have had repeated workers' comp claims over the years, and so my rates keep going up and up, and I can't get out from under it. And this is, you know, a quarter million dollars a year of cost. This is significant. If I was in Indiana, I'd be looking at maybe a hundred. You know, that's, that's significant savings. And I, I tell you, I mean, so eons ago, back at the at the end of the last century, the late '90s, I uh, ran a, a grant program that the state administers for small to mid-sized manufacturers and provide uh, grant money for training, retraining of workers, ISO 9000, mm -hmm. or you buy a piece of equipment, you want to train your workers on it, digital aid, whatever. And so I had the opportunity running that program because part of the application process was doing site visits to these manufacturing facilities. I don't know anything about manufacturing, but I mean, I, it's just basically to ensure it wasn't a P.O. box. Right. They're running they're an actual manufacturing, business. they're producing parts, they're, they're employing human beings and the like. And, uh, you know, invariably, yeah, you have companies on the floor with the, it's been X number of days since our last injury, right? They they advertise, they market how safe their workplace is, how safe their assembly lines are, you know, as a matter of pride, is that we run a safe place 100 days, 300 days, 600 days since we've had an injury on the floor because, to your point, they're, everybody wants to take pride in having a safe workplace. Everybody that's part of the business team, wants to know that this is a safe workplace. And so it really does seem in, in this instance that you have government uh, aligned against the interests, frankly, of both the workers and the businesses. You're absolutely right. Uh, so, okay, so that's one uh, piece of it. Um, give me some of the other component well, parts. property taxes are another big one. Yeah. You know, my business is in suburban Cook County. We enjoy some of the highest property yeah. taxes in the nation. and. You know, we, uh, we're not opposed to paying our fair share. It's not about that. You know, we've been in town, and we're, we've been in Lyons since 1953. We've been in Illinois since 1918. We've certainly paid a lot of property taxes over the years. And again, I'm not opposed to paying them. But when I get my triennial increase and it goes up 63% on my property, I start to lose my mind a little bit. What's gone up 63% in, in, in your world? And who can I charge this 63% increase? Because my customers sure aren't going to take it. So where does that come out of, right? That comes out of me maybe hiring another worker. That comes out of me investing in new equipment to be more efficient. That comes out of uh, investments in plants, you know, to get more efficient and, and to hopefully keep jobs in Illinois. So, you know, uh, so of course, you know, you, you go through the round and you fight it. You hire the attorney and they're going to take their fee and we're going to lower it. it. It's just a game though, Dan, and you've looked at this stuff and you know, we've all seen it. But again, you have these same interests that are making money off of it. A certain group of lawyers that make a heck of a lot of money off this industry and they are, are, are very well funded to help the politicians stay in office well, and not change this. And you're talking about triennial assessment. So once every three years, you know you're going to be facing a hit and you don't know how big that hit's going to be so there's no predictability and so you kind of have to hedge against how much am I going to take how much of a hammering am I going to take every three years and so that as you say that incremental worker or that new piece of equipment you know you've got to kind of hedge against what you can sort of try to anticipate and it's difficult because it's you know kind of mysticism and how property taxation yes. is works in Cook County and everywhere else in Illinois. Um, so, so you you have to sort of uh, restrain yourself from making those kind of productive investments in people and machinery. Absolutely, we we, we need to. We don't know what's going to happen in, in every few years, and and it's already pretty pretty high already. You know, if if this goes through, if if I were to get hit with that full increase, it would be three dollars a square foot on my property taxes, and, and and that's a huge. You know, again, on about seventy five thousand square feet of building, you do the math. Now I go to Indiana, I will be less than a third of that, or Wisconsin, far less than that. So. Again, uh, these costs are coming out of my business, out of my investments, and, and with no predictability and no end in sight to this. This is what scares me. I'm not opposed to paying my fair share, and if I knew it was going to go up, and that's it. That they're going to get the spending under control, they're going to fix the issues that are driving these constant increases. I could work with that. But me and my other business owner friends, there's no end in sight. We and, don't and, know when this is going to stop. And when we're talking about hiring that, uh, that next worker uh, to, uh, to work for your company, um, I think I saw from the Technology and Manufacturing Association, a trade association you're affiliated with, which uh, reps small to mid-sized manufacturers in Illinois, that the uh, average salary for a worker in manufacturing is eighty-two thousand dollars. Absolutely, that's uh, you know one in 
uh, we get kind of 1.6 times the uh, average household income in Illinois. I mean, so these are good paying jobs. Great jobs. These are the jobs that our policymakers should be begging for, should be screaming for, and they should be saying, what can we do to make this a great environment for you to come and locate your business? But I don't understand why they're not. I, I don't understand why they can't hear this message, why they think that businesses like mine are the bad guys in town, that we're the corporate fat cats. The people who, the, this is the, Pat, the famous Pat Quinn formulation, which is not just the opinion of Pat Quinn, businesses are people with the ability to pay, and that's how they're treated in Illinois. It's unbelievable. We don't know. There is not an infinite pot of money here. You know, it's getting to the point that businesses like mine can't make the numbers work in Illinois because we don't just compete against Illinois. You know, so let's say we raise these property taxes and we do all this, and you look at these service industries like like McDonald's. Now they, you know, or, or whatever a restaurant, they compete in a pretty localized area, and maybe the politicians can argue that they can afford to pay. They're going to raise their costs. The local people will pay more, but we can afford it. We 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 do all right here in Illinois. Well, I compete against companies that are in Indiana, in Wisconsin, in Iowa, in Mexico, and in China. I compete not just against the town next door, but the state next door and the country across the world. So we're in a global environment in manufacturing. Again, this is why they're not coming to Illinois. There's no predictability of their costs. There's no reduction in costs in sight, and Illinois is already a high-cost state. So while you have a great workforce, you have all these great things, people can't afford to pay those $80,000 jobs plus all these other costs plus be competitive globally. It just doesn't add up. Well, you know, I mean, the attitude of uh, certain potentates in Springfield is, yeah, if you don't like it, why don't you leave? I don't care. I mean, I mean, that's the are. attitude they, and they, they are take. leaving. And I think the message has been received. They're leaving. Caterpillar is not expanding here. Small businesses are leaving from big and small. They're leaving. I've watched my customers leave. You know, I'm a supply chain business. I, I feed into global supply chains. I don't do a lot of direct exporting. I don't really sell a finished good. I'm a job shop. So other people come to me and say, can you make this widget? Can you make this widget? Can you make that part for me? So I make a lot of pieces that then they put together into things, into airplanes, into telephone switching gear, into all kinds of things, and they export it. So if my, if my customers take their supply chain and leave this state or leave this country, I'm cut out and there's absolutely nothing I can do to remain part of it. I have no control over that. So, you know, I see people leaving, I see businesses leaving, and I sometimes scratch my head and wonder why, why I'm staying here. But, you know, I'm loyal and I've got a lot of good workers in the area. I met, we mentioned the skilled workforce shortage. I have about 10 employees that walk to work. They live in town and they walk and they're very admirable. I live about 15 minutes from my office. So, you know, but at some point the commute and all these other factors won't add up to enough to outweigh the cost of me moving to Indiana or Wisconsin. So workers comp, property taxes, other issues that policymakers should be contemplating with respect to manufacturing, the kind of real wealth producing sector in a way that the service sector is not that positive multiplier. Um, what, what, what else should be on well, the table? you know, litigation in Illinois. We, we, we Civil have justice a, system. We have such an environment that always seems stacked against the employer. You know, I've, I've been involved, whether it's a workers comp case or an insurance case or other things, there are, you know, example after example of of where the burden of proof is on the employer to prove that they have not done whatever it is that this person is claiming that they've done. And as opposed to other states where perhaps the claimant has to prove that they've been wronged. And, and Which is the case in every other civil proceeding. This the standard called the preponderance of the evidence is on the plaintiff side, not on the defendant side in civil proceedings. And for some reason in Illinois, the laws are written such that I have to prove that we did not do what they're claiming. And so, you know, you can you can take it from harassment and discrimination claims to all, all these other things. And, and it's not that we allow any of this to occur. It's that sometimes you have a, a difference of opinion, a disgruntled employee, for example, somebody who's terminated who wants to get a little bit of revenge. Boy, in Illinois, us employers, you know, we're like the porcupines with our quills up. We are wondering what's going to hit us next, and 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 we're very defensive, and, and rightly so. So we spend a lot of time, my HR person, she spends a lot of time uh, documenting and preparing just in case we get sued, right? Building our case and, 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 and making sure that we've got every I dotted and T crossed because you, you just never know who's going to sue you in Illinois, and you need to be able to prove it. Not They need to be able to prove that, they, that you did something wrong. You have to prove you were innocent. So you're one of the, the more outspoken manufacturers in Illinois. You're on the uh, PAC board of the TMA, the Technology Manufacturing Association, the Trade Associate, Association mentioned. So you have the opportunity, the charge, really, to interact and speak with a lot of Illinois state legislators. And it was... Uh, rather telling to me that TMA and their scorecards they do, state legislators, uh, three quarters of the 177 state legislators 
in the General Assembly, House and Senate, uh, essentially received failing grades Absolutely. when it comes to votes on main issues related to manufacturing. And, you know, I know Illinois' uh, main industry is agribusiness, but that necessarily includes huge manufacturers. You mentioned Caterpillar, John Deere, others. And so how do you explain, and if you could relay some of the conversations that you've had with state legislators, where, let me, let me try and kind of square the circle here. Our biggest sector is agribusiness. Uh, a significant portion of that is manufacturing. Everything around uh, Chicago is the transportation hub of the Midwest is logistics and manufacturing, the biggest contiguous industrial park in America in, in Elk Grove Village, all those job shops and mm -hmm. small manufacturers, the airports that we have. So all of this is so dependent on manufacturing and three quarters of the General Assembly has taken a hostile position to manufacturing even as we have not recovered manufacturing jobs the same way that our Midwestern neighbors have. It's, it, you know, people hear this and they're like, well, I, so why are they taking the position they're taking? Uh, do they not get it? Is there something else at play? What's your experience been? Well, yeah, it, it is a good, really good question. I don't know if they don't understand the problem. I, I mean, that's, that's kind of hard to believe. I think they understand. I think there's some other forces at play and, and they're not allowed to vote the right way. I think that there are, are uh, you know, uh, they have a lot of considerations, and I get that. But, uh, <laughs> considerations, yeah. <laughs> it's not necessarily manufacturing in Illinois that they consider when they vote. It's not necessarily job creators that they consider when they vote. And uh, so, so when you have somebody visit your plant, or when you talk to a state legislator in Springfield, or they they visit TMA or whatever, and what, what do they do? They, they kind of you know smile jack you and just say, yeah of course zach i mean we love right. your business we love manufacturing i'm pro manufacturing and manufacturing is so important to illinois and then they go down and they uh, tow the party lines as it were with respect to all the issues that we're discussing yeah and i don't know why it is a party issue this is not a d or an r issue creating a good business environment that can create jobs and grow the middle class this is bipartisan who should who is against this but then you get down to springfield and the way the argument gets framed and the information gets twisted it becomes a party line thing and uh, it's just such a shame so yeah they love to come for the photo op they love to take pictures with the employees, the legislators and the different plants. They love to tell the owner, sometimes it's me when they're visiting my plant, that yeah, we're gonna do something to make a better environment. And they always like to point the finger at somebody else. You know, um, I, I joke that I like legislators when it's face to face, we always get along, but I worry when they go down and they get in a yeah. group, right? Individually, they never disagree, but when they're in a group, they never seem to vote the right way. So is this a, a I mean, understanding that policy failures, they, they seem to be patently obvious. Um, do manufacturers in Illinois bear some responsibility for not being as politically active and as engaged as they should be? I mean, they're, they're getting their lunch handed to them by trial lawyers and the other interests in these cottage industries you're describing. So do manufacturers need to do a better job of activating their employees and activating each other to engage rather than kind of try and play the game, really, frankly, stoke the revolt? Yeah, that's, I, I do think we bear some of the blame, especially, you know, maybe not recently, but for you know 20 years or so, I think that business owners didn't want to get involved, at least the people I talk to, and that's part of why TMA, we do that rating right now. Yeah. And we're trying to encourage our members, you know, we represent a thousand small businesses in Illinois, o almost, almost 40,000 employees, 30 some thousand employees. We are as big as some unions in the state. We should be heard loud and clear, but I think that our business owners, we were busy. We were running a business, and then they went home and they had a family, and then they're involved in charity work, or whatever, all the things that they do, they never took time to get involved in politics. And they said, oh, it's dirty, I don't want to get involved, I don't want to do that, politicians are crooked, I'm not going to do that. So we kind of cheated ourselves for all these years of not being there. And, I, and so when I took over the PAC in, in 2003, the TMA, we raised about three grand a year, and it was about six <laughs> times. You know, That's not going to be enough. No, and we'd pound the table and we'd complain and talk you know, about all these bad things, but they didn't do anything. I said, guys, this is not effective. Politics is time and money and votes. So you got to start educating your employees. You got to start get, telling your employees what's good for the business is good for you. There is no disconnect. It shouldn't be employer versus employee. It should be a healthy business creates healthy jobs. So if your if your employer is profitable, I'll probably get raises at yeah, the business. You're, you know, you guys are so naive and so cute <laughs> thinking that. Um, so uh, there was one. There was a stat earlier this year that was uh, put out by Mark Densler, who's the VP over at Illinois Manufacturers Association, which is a trade association for the bigger operators and, and it was really jarring I mean I mentioned this ad nauseum on my show because it's just so stark it was something like in the 21st century Illinois has like net created one job 
I, I mean, it's like in 17 years, I'm not kidding. I, maybe it was 100 jobs, but it was literally, you could count the number of jobs that have been net created in Illinois on one hand. Meanwhile, you see the explosion going on in, in our Midwestern neighbors and the recovery after the Great Recession going on nationwide and not in Illinois. And it just, do you talk to your employees and, and just other people in your travels in, in a lot of social circles, it just seems like there's nothing that can penetrate the consciousness of certain cross sections of Illinoisans about just exactly how bad it is, number one, mm -hmm. and how bad it's going to get if we don't do a full reverse. There's a critical mass, right? A and that's one of the benefits of being a manufacturer in Illinois. I have all those, you mentioned the Elk Grove Business Park. I, my truck is driving around Elk Grove three times a day, going to platers and painters yeah. and subcontractors. We have this beautiful nexus of vendors, but one by one they disappear. And I have a harder time getting what I need to be successful here in Illinois. And, and it becomes harder and harder to say, well, that's one of the benefits of being in Illinois. So I do think at some point the bottom falls out, right? And that's all just gone. And, and I don't know where, where, the, where the turning point is, but I think we're getting closer and closer to that and, right and, now. And when somebody like you, I mean, not that you're doing this, but somebody like you pulls up stakes after all the sunk costs after so many generations in their business, and many businesses have done that, and moves to Indiana and drops anchor, yeah, no matter what we do, they're not coming back. Never coming back. I mean, come on, because of exactly the reason of the difficulty of making that decision to leave in the first place. I've got a physical structure. I've got all these employees. I've got longstanding relationships. My family's here. I built a life here, but it's so bad. I can't make it make sense to be here or to have my business here. So I'm moving to Northwest Indiana or Wisconsin or wherever I move. And then I'm going to invest reinvest all those resources and kind of sweat equity and relationship building time somewhere else, then in my lifetime, there is no scenario, no matter how good Illinois makes it, uh, under which I would come back. So it is gone forever, forever. effectively. Forever, forever. And, and I just hope that uh, this message can get through in Springfield. So that's part of why we did the rating, you know, really two thirds of legislators are, in our opinion at TMA, anti-manufacturing. And again, they'll come for the photo op, they'll say they're pro, but their voting record sure doesn't show it. And, and I want that message to get out loud and clear. And, and, and until they start voting the other way, Illinois is at peril. This is a great business. Those $89,000 jobs are leaving and they will never ever come back. So how do you react? How do you, you and your colleagues in this space react when you see, now this is a decade ago, but all of the hullabaloo and the incentives to get Boeing to locate their corporate headquarters here in the near west loop to bring you know a couple hundred uh, C-suite executives here. No, the, the manufacturing plant for the, uh, the, the their new airplanes goes to Charleston, South Carolina, but we've got the executives here because they want to enjoy the nightlife in Chicago. Um, and we, they get you know something $80 million in incentives to locate a bunch of white collar guys who can pay their own way here. Mm -hmm. And now, of course, the uh, excitement um, as displaced as it is, is about HQ2. And we're gonna give, you know, if Jeff Bezos comes here and we rename Chicago Amazon and all the, and we give them all their tax revenue back to the $1.2 billion in tax revenue for their employees that they expect to generate, we give it back to Amazon to say, use it however you want. If you locate uh, one of your, your, your headquarters here, um, Boy, that we're super excited about marquee names. Yes. And we'll uh, you basically mortgage the farm to bring a couple hundred Boeing executives here, a bunch of high paid executives from Amazon to locate their uh, secondary headquarters here. And I'm not opposed to that, of course. Um, and manufacturing, yeah. That's where I don't get it, because you mentioned it earlier, the multiplier effect, right? We watched it in Wisconsin with Foxconn. Now, in that case, I think that was a wise incentive because I think these jobs are priceless. We can talk about the multiplier effect, and we, we hear that there is, you know, two to three. Some economists even say three, three to one. For every dollar in manufacturing, you're going to generate two to three dollars of ancillary activity. And no industry, corporate headquarters certainly don't have that multiplier effect. Uh, warehouses don't have that multiplier effect. 
manufacturing does because you need you know, you know your truck you need your employees you buy your paper you buy your metal you buy your plating and all these services your packaging everything that goes with it where a warehouse they have forklifts and they have some employees and they move and some trucks come and go and that's about it and they buy some paper to send their invoices but manufacturing needs so many factors of production machinery equipment things go into it. That's why you get that multiplier effect. So those jobs are, in my opinion, priceless and we should be prioritizing and putting incentives on getting those here. I'm not opposed to getting corporate headquarters here or things like that. Those are good, but you just don't get the pop that you get out of manufacturing. Well, that's, I mean, that's the priceless one. Elon Musk says that we only have a 5 to 10% chance to survive the oncoming war with robots. So, I mean, I guess it doesn't, I get the end of the day, it doesn't really matter that much since we're going to be conquered by the robots. Well, you'll have a higher chance of surviving if you can build your own robots. That's yeah, I suppose. Of, some I suppose. Uh, enemy robots to fight them back, right? So now you're um, also a uh, village trustee. So you're, uh, you know, you don't get enough punishment in the manufacturing sector here. You're also a locally elected official in <laughs> Illinois. Um, so you're a real masochist. Um, village trustee, uh, community of Burr Ridge. Yes. And so, um, you know, I mean, there's a lot of intersection in terms of the policy discussions we're having about uh, where we are at in Illinois and its impact on the cost structure that manufacturers face and where we're at in Illinois in terms of the cost structure that uh, Illinois taxpayers face, generally speaking. Mm -hmm. So um, kind of give me the, um, the, the compare contrast between your a life as a uh, executive for a manu family owned manufacturing company and what you face with the Illinois policy regime and what you're facing as a village trustee with the Illinois policy regime. I think there's more comparisons than contrasting. You know, it is really a small business that I've seen, you know, at, 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 the, at the village. You have your product is services, right? Mm -hmm. And at the village, we're responsible for police services and we're responsible for road. We have other things, but those are our primary cost driver. Public works, you know, we have the roads and things we maintain in the police service. And uh, so that's our product, and, and we get X amount of money in the tax levy. And, you know, this was an education point for me this year, learning how the tax levy works. And towns cannot just, uh, let's say we want to hire 30 more police officers, or we want to put in a new bridge or a new road. We can't just raise the tax levy infinitely. It's set in statute in Springfield. We can only raise it a small percent every year, and it's kind of uh, set set on, on the growth in the village and the cost of living. It's tied to indexes, so it's pretty small. And 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 on the village, you know, people look at their tax bill and they're they're angry about it. Sometimes they come to the village hall and they say, "I'm really mad. My taxes went up." And we point out to them that on the tax bill, it's about two percent. So you know, for every hundred dollars on your tax bill, the village is getting roughly two dollars property tax property bill. taxes, and we run out of that. The uh, police and the roads and all those other services that the village does. And uh, so, you know, we try to be, at least in Burridge, we're pretty efficient and, and, and we try to budget pretty well. And, and despite some fake news that's been out there, we have had balanced budgets. We add to the reserves every year. And I've been fortunate because I, I just got elected in April, but before I was there, we had a history of trustees who ran the village pretty prudently and, and mayors and trustees who made prudent decisions and, and were fiscally conservative. But, you know, I see it's the same in my business, right? If you, if you, you can't raise your prices on your cost customers only so much, right? They're, they're going to revolt. And in this case, uh, even if I, I might have the ability, they wouldn't stay. So you have to live within your means. You have to budget and you have to deal with what you've got. And then you've got to provide your product or your service in the village. So I've, I've, I've got a, a unique perspective on it. But the thing of it is, is that uh, you really have to watch the cost, whether it's your business, whether it's your village. And, and so I say this to the legislators in Springfield. It's great to make those promises. Everybody wants to promise five more police officers because the town is safer. Everybody wants to promise a better retirement. But how are you going to pay for that going forward? How are you going to pay for that for the next whatever? When you hire a police officer, they're on your payroll for 30 years, potentially or longer, right? That's the gift that keeps on, on, on giving, the cost that keeps coming. So you've got to pay for that and their retirement. And I just think people don't understand that that these legislators aren't looking at the true cost of what it is they're doing when they make promises. It's nice to make promises, but if you can't fulfill them, no one's going to be happy in the end. So speaking of that, how much uh, uh, does national policy now impacting uh, how you think about staying in Illinois and, and your colleagues think about staying in Illinois and think about the, uh, the tax cuts that are pending, the tax cut plan mm -hmm. that's pending? Mm -hmm. And basically, uh, my kind of drill down on this is that the plan is essentially to make the working rich pay for relief at the top end and at the low end. And in blue states like Illinois, California, New York, Connecticut, blue states that are high tax states at the state and local level, when you have caps on your deductibility for property taxes mm -hmm. and state and local taxes, 
you have caps on your mortgage in interest deduction. Um, how does that impact uh, the calculus of staying here? Yeah, well, so for me, I, I was a fan of the of the of the tax plan that came through here. You know, I, I I spoke in favor of it, and I think lowering the rate and simplifying it was important. Um, but I think we missed an opportunity to broaden the base, and and it's the same thing uh, whether it's my local taxes or or national. You know, you can lower them or raise them, but who's paying them, right? Right. Th that's what matters, and, and I. I they come together. I think we miss an opportunity to broaden the base uh, in the U.S. with the tax reform. I think the simplification is great. I think the lowering, especially for the corporate, is great. We'll hopefully drive, you know, uh, my small business, one is a C-corp, so we'll, we pay taxes, you know, at, at that way. We have an S-corp and we have two LLCs. So I think... So the S-corp or the C-corp you stand to, you know, benefit. Benefit from, and, and that's where we make the majority of our money. So I think we'll see some benefit as a small business. So I want the message to get out that it's not just big corporations that are organized in this way. Small family businesses and other companies will see relief in this plan. But, um, you know, what I think we missed was so these big companies. I just saw in the news last week, Facebook, because of political pressure, is going to start declaring revenue in different countries and paying taxes there. Largely, I guess what Facebook has done is, you know, they make money on ads and they declare all the revenue in Ireland where they pay a very, very low tax rate. I think it's 3 or 5%. I'm not, not sure exactly, but Ireland has a very low tax Corporate rate. rate yeah. Apple's there and a lot of companies are there. And so what we missed with this tax reform was the chance to capture all, more income from companies that are offshoring or that are, we hear about inversions or moving things around. And, and what I proposed was a thing called sales factor apportionment. And this is the way they do it uh, in the states. So the states collect taxes from companies, income taxes, from companies that operate in multiple states. And the way it works is uh, if I'm a company one, two, three, and I made a million dollars in profit this year, and I operated in two states, and I got 50% of my profit from each of those states, I'm going to pay half of my half of my tax, uh, you know, tax on half of my income in one state and half of the other. So you divide it up by where the income originated from, where the sales came from. So Apple doesn't matter if they're if they're headquartered in Ireland, they're making all their money in the U.S., they should pay some U.S. taxes on it right now. And that's what we missed. Had, had we broadened the base in this way, we could have lowered the tax rate by about 9% without losing any revenue. We could have captured a lot of revenue. And all these foreign companies who love the U.S. market, right, they're benefiting from the biggest consumer market in the world, they're paying no taxes to benefit our country and benefit our operation and benefit the market that they take advantage of. So we really missed a chance to capture these global companies and capture some profit from all of them. And when I do, when I say that, I'm not here, you know, I'm a corporate guy, right? I, 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 I want corporations to pay their fair share, and I think they want to. If you make it unreasonable, if you make it outrageous, if you make it too high, they can't pay. But if you make it a fair, reasonable rate and you subject it to everybody and you really get a broad base, you should have a successful tax policy. And I think we missed that chance a little bit here in the U.S. And as you mentioned at the outset, you don't just compete with Indiana, you compete with India and China. And so uh, the, the other component part of the discussion with manufacturing is about trade policy. And so your reaction to Trump's rather aggressive posture towards China, at least rhetorically, it hasn't translated into uh, a trade war yet, which a lot of people have trepidation about, particularly free traders like myself. Um, and and w where you come down on taking a harder line against China and other international competitors that have industrial policies that are mm -hmm. kind of government-directed private sector operations like Communist China. Uh, how, how should we be conceiving trade policy to enhance the interests of U.S. manufacturers without hammering our consumers the way that some of these uh, less enlightened countries hammer their consumers? Well, I, I, so I appreciate what you're saying. I don't think it has to be protectionist versus free trade. I think it's smart trade. I think that's what we're missing. And it's not just China. I mean, look at Germany, right? There, we have companies that, uh, countries that overproduce and underconsume. China and Germany are two of the biggest ones. And they have industrial policies to support those kind of things. So they have very, uh, we have a trade deficit, they have trade surpluses, and trade deficits do matter. Over time, they do add up, I believe, and, and, and they, they, they do come to roost at some point. And so these countries- Why do have, they matter? Uh, because I think you can't, over time, deficits, it leads into deficits and deficit spending, and, and I think that over time, and it translates to jobs and growth and all these things in, in what we're talking about in Illinois. 
we can't get that great multiplier effect out of manufacturing jobs if we've traded them away for whatever we traded when we, when we made these deals. And so, you know, so for example, uh, they, they overproduce and underconsume, and they count on the U.S. as the market of last resort to buy all their overconsumption, buy all their overproduc uh, overproduction, I mean, uh, while well, we consume. And so what, what happens is, is not that I want to have you know, a government saying we're going to have this industry or that industry, but, but in the end, this could come down to, the, to, to where we're going to see in the next 20, 30, 40 years the difference between capitalism and communism winning. You know, the Cold War didn't work out so good for the Russians, and, and they had a very planned economy, and they said we're going to have this many potatoes and this many of this. Chinese do it very differently. They say we want to have the solar industry. We want to have industry. They don't tell you how you're going to get there, but they do say our banks are going to lend money. You know, they just have a policy to support these companies, so they give loans that may or may not ever need to be paid back. They can reduce well, local taxes. They can do all kinds of things to support this kind of growth. Yeah, but I mean, but, but do you believe that the 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 Chinese communists, uh, this small group of communists, are any more intelligent? They've got it all figured out. The interactions of mi hundreds of millions, if not billions, of people, they've got it any better figured out than the uh, Soviets. Politburo did. No, I mean but, that's that's one of the great the great uh, well fatal conceits to borrow a Hayekism of communism is that a small group of people can figure it all out. I don't think they can figure it out, but I think they are setting a policy to encourage investment, encourage industry, and that's what I'm talking about here. If you don't have a plan, you have a plan to fail. I mean, come on, we have business plans. You have a that plan. That sounds like somebody with an MBA. You, you know, well, <laughs> I don't. I don't have an MBA, but oh, I'm smart enough to know right. that when I want to get somewhere, I make a plan and a roadmap of how I want to get there. And every other country that the U.S. deals with has an industrial policy. The last time we had one was when Alexander Hamilton was the president. So we haven't had one for a long, long time. Are you hoping that uh, Lynn Miranda, Lynn Manuel Miranda, does a play about you? Is that? What your what um, the industrial policy? Uh, no, you know, um, maybe somebody will do a play, or maybe maybe it'll be a comedy, maybe it'll be a horror. I'm not <laughs> yeah. quite sure. In the end, we'll be crying or laughing. But you know, I I do hope that we have some kind of a policy here in this country, and that. But we but have I mean, is it is it? I mean, sorry to interrupt, but is it is it you want uh, not just the president, but Congress to take a more aggressive posture towards intellectual piracy and telescoping of technology that's not uh, freely exchanged and so forth. Um, so that we drive a better deal for American consumers, ultimately, that's what this is about. Um, or is it really you You think, I mean, because industrial policy, to me, has a central planning connotation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you don't strike me as a central planning type of guy, so I just want to clarify that. No, to me, a good industrial policy could be things like, let's talk about in the Illinois context. Uh, if you want to support manufacturing in Illinois, you're going to lower the workers. You're going to yeah, do things exactly. that fix that. You're going to do right. things that fix so, the environment. Yes, exactly. So that could be the policy that comes out. Not necessarily picking winners or losers or industries, but a policy that makes it a, a healthy place to do business, a healthy place to manufacture things, a healthy place to employ people and create jobs. And, and so if we don't have a, a strategic plan to do that, I think that our competitors are going to eat our lunch. Do you, do you think, you know, people, uh, the, the, the specter of Chicago and Illinois per the balance sheet, you know, invokes comparisons to Detroit, to Puerto Rico, <laughs> and to other, you know, failed cities and states. Um, do you think, and, but, but that's dismissed because Chicago's economy is more diversified than Detroit and all of the excuses, uh, well, all of the, the counter arguments, I guess, would be more fair than excuses. But do you see the possibility that, look, if you continue to stifle innovation and growth in uh, wealth producing sectors like manufacturing, that, yeah, it's not going to be Detroit tomorrow, it's not going to be Puerto Rico tomorrow, um, but the idea that it can't happen here, to me, uh, again, it's one of these uh, kind of self-regarding responses uh, to dismal numbers. Do you believe that it, it could happen? Here? I do believe it could happen. It's a, it's a matter of time. I, I think if we don't change course, it will happen. They, they can't keep shuffling the money. Which cup is it under today? And that's the game that we're playing. And, and back to my federal policy thing, it's the same thing there. I'm not saying the Chinese are going to do it any better than the Russians did, but I am saying that they've got the time on their side. Just keep the clock ticking and keep the game playing. And they have made decisions and put policies in place that put time on their side to keep this game going. And, and if 
if we can't keep our game going right, which which one who you know it's a matter of time. And, and so as they have generated wealth over there, as other states have generated wealth over here, I watch the U.S. suffer because of these things, and I watch Illinois suffer because of these things. Where I see other countries, other states, other governments making plans to generate growth and generate wealth. If you don't make it, mine it, or grow it, you're just shuffling the money around, these service industries. And they're important, and, and they add on. But at some point, you need to truly generate wealth. America's farmers do it, their ranchers do it, their manufacturers do it, and their mining and energy industries. That's the first level of creating wealth in any economy. And I don't know how we got so off track in the last 20 years that everybody's going to be in the service industry, everybody's going to go to college and have a degree and make six figures, because I don't see that adding up. And you know, I, again, I'm, I'm not quite 40 yet. I have friends who have doctorates and can't make more than 20 grand. And they're in debt up to their eyeballs with student loans, where if they had gone into a manufacturing program and gotten one of those $89,000 a year jobs, yeah. they'd be a lot better off than they are and right now. Not as much de demand for medieval poetry PhDs <laughs> yes. as uh, people. And they're very intelligent there people. They write some good poems, but yeah. it doesn't pay the yeah. bills, Dan. Exactly. Doesn't pay the Lord, bills. Not enough Lord Macaulay's running around. He is Zach Model. He is the chief alignment officer of Atlas Toolworks, a fourth generation manufacturing company in Lyons, Illinois. Zach, thanks so much for joining us on this edition of Against the Current. It's great to be here, Dan. Thank, Thank you. you.